Facebook. Okay. Here we go. All right. Hi, Abe-san. <laughs> Thank you for attending. <laughs> All right. So as we wait for everybody to join us and get logged on, um, I just want to know if you guys have ever eaten at Mark Tarbell's restaurant or bought anything from his wine shop. Ueno-san has. He raised his hand so fast. And so so <laughs> he said it's so good. Um, so as we wait just a few minutes here, I just want to remind you guys that we do have a Q&A all the way at the end of the session. So please be sure to use the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your toolbar there. And if you're gonna chat something, please make sure to say, uh, send it to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see. Sometimes like, you know, we're responding to something that only the panelists can see and then we look a little crazy, but uh, just rest assured somebody is talking to us. <laughs> Alrighty. I've actually never eaten at Tarbell's, but I would be so interested if the food is anything like what we have paired, like coming up today. Um, but yes, I'm so excited because to have a chef pair things with sake, it's pretty unusual, at least, you know, in my line of work, it's, it's a lot more uh, Japanese food centric and not as much with Western foods. So I'm really interested to see what Mark has to say about pairing sake with Western style foods or foods that are outside of Japanese cuisine. All right. Okay, let's see. Just waiting one more moment here. Okay. And we will have the recipes up for you guys um, by tomorrow on our website, and that will be linked in the follow-up email as well. So you'll be able to recreate these at home. Um, they look incredibly fancy, though, so I think uh, I would be a little intimidated. But if you have a chef in the family, they can give it a try. All right. Okay. So let's get started. Um, welcome to the versatility of sake, food pairing with Chef Mark Carbell. Uh, my name is Ida Vong. I am a sake specialist and I work for Sake School of America as well as Mutual Trading Company. And today I am joined by Toshio Ueno. He is the co-founder of Sake School of America as well as vice president of Sake School of America and our lead instructor. Uh, we also have Chef Mark Carbell. He is here with us. Uh, he has so many things under his belt. It's crazy and it's amazing. I don't know how one person can do all that in a lifetime, but Ueno-san will uh, introduce him a little bit further. Um, before that, though, I would like to just kind of give you a quick overview of what's going to happen today. So after the introduction, um, Ueno-san is going to go over the three selected sake or featured sake for today with the food pairing. And um, just dive a little bit into what Mark has lined up for us. And then we'll pass the torch over to Mark so he can uh, tell us what he has for us on the menu, as well as the sake that he's paired it with. OK, Ueno-san, take it away. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a special event for me. Uh, you know, I know Mark for a long, long time, and I'm totally excited about having him today. And I appreciate that he agreed to do this with us. Thank you very much, Mark Sang. And Welcome. thank you, thank you so much. And I, I will put on somewhere, and I will do the introduction uh, introduction of Mark Sang. That's very, very long, long, big, big, so many things he has done in his life. So uh, Chef Mark Tabel is a restaurant, as everyone knows, and also wine expert and chef extraordinaire. And he's an icon too. He started uh, fascinated with uh, cooking in age of 814 and at age of 18, Mark Tabelson completed the culinary apprenticeship at the Sonesta Hotel in Amsterdam, Poland, 
then went to the study in Paris. Yay. I hope uh, <laughs> he can teach me some uh, French. At the cookies, we, 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 uh, we go to cuisine, the ballerine, adding a grande diploma. I don't know how to pronounce them, so I will let him do and study wine at Steven, Steven Spears Academy Duban. Wow. Um, we are kind of sad uh, he just passed away, but that's a great, great school. And uh, people still, uh, you know, go to his school in the future and learn about wine. And then he, apprent uh, he went to three star. Taiyuban, wow. First, uh, one star, Michel Basquet, and Witty Wines in Paris. And he returned to US and uh, he was chef at Oracle House in the Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Wow, you're all over the place. I, I wonder where you're, he's from. But anyway, and uh, he went to Cambridge, Massachusetts and uh, worked as a chef at the Vintage Wine Bar. And, and also he started teaching over there in uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire, uh, Wine School Cambridge at the University of New Hampshire Hospitary School and about uh, French wine and also work at the Knight Baker at White Flower Baker in Boston, supplying bread to all the top Boston restaurants. Wow. He's a chef and a baker too. <laughs> and then, he opened the Tabel restaurant right now. Uh, he's uh, a straight, straight in there. Uh, in 1994, he has been nominated as Best Chef Southwest by the James Beard Foundation. And in 2017, he was nominated for Rocky Mountain Regional Emmy for hosting Czech Peas Arizona on Arizona PBS. And Tabel won the three Emmys as host of Arizona PBS show named Great on poor, and he is a two time inductee into Arizona Hall, culinary fame of outstanding chef and media master. Wow. Uh, more to come. <laughs> <laughs> Mark wow. has been a wine judge for many, many years uh, for uh, 20 years in Los Angeles international wine competitions. And, uh, and also he is served as uh, many advisory councils and boards, including Arizona Department of Education Advisory Council, board members of Phoenix Art Museum, and many more. And right now he owns a Tabels restaurant, Tabans wine bar, wine store, the Tabels catering, and also the Taban at the Phoenix Hello. Sky Harbor Airport Terminal 3 in Phoenix. So even though you're just stopping by the Phoenix, you can go to that station terminal 3 and have his uh, food with great wine sections. So, so that's him. And I'm going to introduce about our sake section. Um, Mark and I both selected. Wow, this picture is such a great picture, Mark. Nice. Amy's, right? Correct? Is that yes. Amy's on your house? Wow. Yes. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, uh, you. so we have a three course. Uh, first course is a tree of uh, Petrosian Osteria caviar on the chip and uh, classic Friulian fra Frico eggplant and roasted lettuce. Pepper Lilish with number Beijing Awa Sparkling Sake. That's number one. And second course is they bought Jumbo Scallop Kudo with uh, pomegranate, avocado mousse, hops made aioli, micro uh, stancho, and crispy garlic with Gangi Yu Nangi Jumai Dagi Jo. Third course is a ch chicken confit. Uh, parsnip puree, demi grass at locally grown wood, all the most natural in Shebel. With Nonguchi Honjo's on Murokana Makenshi. So, one by one, Nambu Bibijin is located in Iwate Prefecture, northern part of Japan. Alcohol is 12%. Awa 
it means bubble in uh, Japanese. Uh, this is uh, they uh, coordinate, uh, they established an association with the Sparkling Sake Association. He's one of them. I think there are about 28 or 29 now. Uh, uh, sake brewery joined this association making a, a traditional way of making uh, sparkling sake. The second fermentation takes in the bottle like a campaign. And uh, it's using a gin otome local rice. And that's that. A brewery is founded in 1902, so about 120 years old, a brewery. And uh, tasting no says this elegant and a perfectly balanced sparkling sake is made with local gin otome rice and volcanic water. It has a calming floral aroma and a crisp carbonation, which offsets the soft mouth feel of the sake. Finally, the delicate umami undertones these uh, palate to creamy and satisfying finish. That's number one sake. Number two. Is Gangi Yunangi Jumai Daiginjo from Yamaguchi Prefecture in South. Alcohol is 60%, uh, a little bit drier side. Acidity is 1.8, so it's a little bit drier, light style. Amino acid is kind of low. Polish ratio is 45 using Yamada Nishiki, uh, King of Rice. And 1922 was they are founded. And so, uh, this one uh, is much, much more leaner, uh, lighter, and a more uh, crispier than uh, usual uh, sake. And I, it, it, it goes well with his dish today. And uh, we will do that in the future when he will visit his restaurant in the future, or Taban. And he has a wine shop next to it too. So that's that. Number three dish is uh, Noguchi Muroka Nama Genshu from Ishikawa Prefecture. This is Muroka means not using charcoal filtration. Nama means unpasteurized. Genshu means not diluted. That's why the whole, whole level is high in 18% using gohaku mango rice. So it gives you a little bit more tighter, a little bit more earthier uh, feel. This is a new brewery, a Noguchi Toji, as you can see the, uh, the picture here. We call him God of Sake Brewing. He is uh, brewing sake for 70, uh, 70, zero, 70 years. And he is a living legend. And that's that. And it's, it has a dry and sharp finish, but really nice tropical foods and juicy with pear and more broader mouthfeel, a little bit of a sweeter side, but it has so many things going on and it gives you such a nice uh, finish at the same time. It's not too, too much of that, you know, the uh, uh, sugar you taste stay in your mouth. No, it cuts off because this is uh, fortified with alcohol, okay? That's the three sake we selected with his super dish, three dish. Okay, Mark-san. Okay. Take your time, take it on. Thank, thank you very, very, very much. I appreciate it. So. Um, so for me, the world of sake, you know, being a, a Western chef and uh, someone who trained in France and, you know, really plays a lot in the Mediterranean basin, but has spent my, uh, a lot of my life just enjoying wine, principally, you know, my foundation was in Europe, of course, but I've traveled the world about wine. So the introduction of sake for me was um, something fascinating. It was, it happened in the, in the late eighties or so. I befriended a um, Japanese uh, master sushi chef who became a friend and also helpful to me in understanding the cuisine, culture and uh, whatnot. But it, it was a revelation, you know, obviously it became a, a slow burning revelation. And then meeting Toshio-san, you know, has really helped tremendously in working with mutual trading. So what, what I, what I found and what I've discovered, which everybody now knows, is the world of sake is really very uh, aligned with the world of wine. 
And so when I have a fascination with food and wine pairing, and so for me, the, the, the parameters are uh, acidity, uh, sugar, or acidity, tartness, sugar, roundness, alcohol, uh, creaminess, uh, effervescence or sparkling wine, um, you know, a, a, a certain amount of depth. And of course, when you go into sakis, there's aged sakis, there's barrel aged sakis. So the, the world of sake um, mirrors in some respects the world of wine in terms of its complexity and breadth of, of flavors and complexities. So for me, being a simple person, I just thought, well, obviously there's an alignment here. And what I've been fascinated with for the last 20 years is pairing sake with Western food and, you know, taking some of the, um, which, you know, is uniquely, I suppose my, I can do that being, being a Western chef, um, cause I'm not bound by certain parameters and, and ideas. So, you know, with the first one we chose, um, this, this, uh, this, this sparkling uh, sake is really special. I mean, not only does it have creaminess and effervescence, mm, mm, but it has a certain depth of character and weight to it. I mean, there's a, obviously, a, a, you could call it fruit character or, you know, an underlying, you know, haunting um, fruit character or sweetness. But what's really comes forward is a um, minerally attack and, and bubbles. And to me, when I'm doing that in any any kind of food and wine pairing, is I would pick something that, you know, would normally be served with champagne. And I always like doing. I'm now a fan of potato chips, uh, and caviar. This is Petrosiano Cetra caviar, with house made creme fraiche. And anytime you have certain um, boldness and also effervescence, you know, salt and crispiness tend to be the to be a very good balance for me. And then I move into something that's a little bit more, uh, has a lot of depth and it's gonna really play with the power of that extract if you, that underlying weight that's in this wine. So this is roasted red pepper and um, uh, organic roasted eggplant. It's basically a, a eggplant comp compote or caponata. Um, so that was my next choice. And then of course, I'm a, fascinated with, uh, this looks like France, it's from Northwestern Italy. This is a, um, a classic trico with made with Montazio cheese, and it's basically cheese crisps. So cheese crisp, you can't. Someone said they can't see. Is it not working? Uh, yes, I hope it is. Anyway. Yeah, you're good. It's you're good. Okay, good. Um, so I've sent recipes for all of this uh, to Ida, and we were happy to share. But these are some of the concepts I would have with the first uh, the first wine. I think that you know, and after tasting it, you know, I think that. When you play with these, I think it'll work very well. I call them wine. I'm sorry, the second first sake. Uh, the ganji, the, the second one, um, what I find is uh, that this has a pureness and a cleanness to it. Mm. Reminiscent to me, so it may be surprising, but of a, of a ripe year of Sancerre, you know, uh, from the very uh, western side of the Loire Valley, in a town called Sancerre famously known for growing Sauvignon Blanc. And most people wouldn't think of that, but you know, sometimes in ripe years, you get some of this roundness and this beautiful character along with a certain amount of acidity. Um, and to me, when I'm doing something like that, you know, I naturally go to um, the next thing I'm gonna show you is something very playful a little bit, but it is um, scallop crudo. So a raw scallop that has just had a touch of uh, time with a little lime juice and salt. And then we do a uh, pomegranate consomme. Consomme, uh, pomegranates are naturally very tart, which, which lend well to this uh, preparation. Then we do a little avocado mousse, which brings richness and aioli, a little richness. So it's overall a very balanced idea. And, you know, when you have it with this, and this doesn't have tremendously high alcohol, the first wine, the sparkling sake only has 12% alcohol, which is relatively low in the world of wine. And this one, um, while it may have a bit more, I think Toshio can uh, talk about that, it still has the impression of um, a cleanness and a very clean finish. And you get sort of that mountain wonderful, uh, you know, if you've had some mineral water from a mountain area, you might get a uh, haunting sort of impression of that in there to me. So, um, and then the third one, uh, the third sake, you know, this is <clears throat> a very bold sake. Uh, this is, um, I love this one because, you know, everyone talks about, like, you know, I'm going to taste it real quick and just, mm. 
reflect on it a little bit. Um, you know, we, this has more alcohol and power. You know, you would it typically, it, you might find some linear, uh, some compass, you know, some comparables with like a, a big Chardonnay from a, you know, from the Santa Barbara or coastal areas that had some ripeness. Um, and this one is, um, you know, what I call weight. It has fat, it has mouthfeel. Now, naturally that does come from alcohol, but also has to be extracted from the whole process, you know, of, of the beauty of the selection of uh, rice and how delicately they've handled it so they could pull some of that extraction out, which gives weight a little bit of, um, you know, slightly tart slash bitter and not in an unattractive way, but a very nice way, which is kind of reflective of the alcohol and extract, but also uh, a little, the weight also has a, a bit of, um, you know, softness to it, which I really, really, really find uh, lovely and attractive. Um, so, but this wine has more power and when you have more power, then you start to graduate in my view into something that has a little more strength. Now this dish, um, we, are playing around with this. So I love duck confit, but we are getting these great chickens from Tuwash Ranch here in uh, Arizona, uh, organically grown and they come fresh. And the, the leg meat we've decided to do in the same fashion as duck confit. Um, with the camera angle, is it tough? I'm reading something. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if, so just let you guys know, he's using two devices. I've pinned them. I don't know if you can see it if you're on your phone, you might have to switch to a gallery view. It's oh, on I your see. Phone? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you're looking at me, you're not seeing any of this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a second uh, phone. Yes. You're right. Yes. So, so there's another guy see. that's named Mark on there. Yeah. I'm, I'm Mark Tarbell's <laughs> wife. One I can see very, it. I can see it. I can see it. I have, a, I have a food head on one and then this one. But it, since you did not have a chance to see it, I'm going to roll back over to this one, um, which is the scallop nice. crudo. And then this one, which um, is the caviar and the caponata and the frico. So those are those three. And then back to the scallop crudo. And of course, back to this one. So I like to dance with things. So naturally, I've made a lot of duck confit in my life, being a French trained chef. But, you know, there's something a little bit more uh, elegant and succulent about doing it with a really beautifully um, um, produced organic chicken. And we use the legs and do it in the same way, but we use duck fat because it's very clean and very, very flavorful. And then we make a little compote here with some, um, these are locally grown um, king trumpet uh, mushrooms from a local farmer. And then of course we have the puree. In this case, it's a uh, uh, parsnip puree or you can do the subis, um, which I think I gave you the recipe for, and then um, chervil on top, which is just, so getting back to the wine, I think it's very important that, you know, this is a bold dish, but not too bold. And the wine is powerful, so it needs something, uh, you know, to grab onto, you know, it needs something to kind of like, and this dish needs to be knocked down just a little bit. And the two together, they don't fight, they play nice. And what's mm -hmm. left is the beautiful character of this sake and the richness of the dish, which is underlying. So I wish we were all in the same room tasting these uh, as, a, as, a, as a group, because there's nothing better than sharing some of this stuff with friends. So. That's my quick summary of why I chose what I would do, but I would love to take questions. And I will just say that for me, this is a, an endlessly fascinating uh, opportunity to play with food and, uh, and sake. And, you know, there's, there's almost, you can make mistakes, but it also leads you to something more beautiful over time. But if you treat it with the same idea or that circle of taste, you know, between acid, uh, being um, balancing out sugar or extract or fruit acid, or and you balance out alcohol and dryness and a little bit of sweetness in the bidding and, and the creamiest mouthfeel. You know, you got a nigori, sparkling sake, you know, something that is unfiltered. It's going to be a lot more, uh, have a creamier mouthfeel, which is going to uh, also be fun to play with in a lot of different dishes. So we just have tons of fun. We drink lots of sake <laughs> and we see what we can do with it. Maxan, uh, Maxan. Uh, do me a favor. Can you uh, eat from course number one, one by one, and yes. drink? And yeah. can you explain about, you know, sometimes like you know, with sake with a blue cheese, uh, when, uh, that's my best uh, pairing with the cheese, that the yes. cheese taste changes completely and comes out the new taste that which I enjoy. So 
I, 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 I'm hungry, but you know, I, I want you to, everybody's looking at the dish. I appreciate everybody's like, I want to be there. But yeah. Taste with you. I wish we all, you know, I, if you can do one by one, taste with the yeah. sake and what kind of a taste of your dish uh, combined with sake and what comes out, what goes away and what comes yeah. out next and, you know, those flavor, you know. Happy to do that. Yes, please. So, Thank you. Um, you know, I, you say blue cheese. Blue cheese is sort of a magic ingredient in food and wine pairing, and it does transform into a secondary, most interesting flavor, especially if there's a little sweetness. But okay, I'm going to do the Ocetra. With great pain, I'm going to try this Ocetra caviar. Mm. Fattiness, richness, a little salinity. Mm. Mm. So what happens here, is you're just left supported on top of this fattiness, richness, and the salinity. You're just supported with, when I talked about that middle palate on this with, you know, it's not, it's, I would call it fruit extract, but it's not because it's um, rice, but it has that same character, which is kind of dancing on the palate, a brightness to it, a creaminess to it, to a degree, but mostly it, almost like, a, I don't want to be unfair, but there's a residual sweetness that's left after that. But it's really nice because of the effervescence, very cleansing. And it just cleans up that that dish beautifully. Um, now I'm going to do caponata, which has a little bit of olive oil and a little bit more depth to it. I also have a question here from um, Kayoko Abe-san. So, like, what kind of salt would you recommend for each sake? Possibly, like, what kind of savory notes? I guess. What kind of what of kind of salt? Yeah, she says salt. salt. Okay. Um, well, you know, I'm a fan of. Fleur de Sel, Sel Gris, which is, has a little bit more of a minerally character. But I'm also mm -hmm. a fan of um, flaky Maldons and something mm -hmm. very simple like that, pink Himalayans. Um, but I would go with a lighter salt, like a Maldon or, um, um, yes, you know, that would probably work very well. Something flaky and sort of light. Yeah, I don't think you want to get too much salinity into it. You know, good caviar is very low in salt, I mean, relatively low in salt. And Parmigiano Reggiano, which you can make these crisps out of, is also a little higher in salt, where Montazio is a little creamier and lower in salt, which is Montazio is from Northwestern Italy, a region called Friuli Venezia Giulia, uh, near Trieste on the border of Croatia. Very, very nice cheese, very lovely cheese. All right, so that salt is gonna be your general answer for all three sakes, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Salt is important and super important in cooking but you don't you know not enough is bad and too much is you know too much yes <laughs> so how's now, the cheese i will say the montazio you know did a little bit more dominated you know a little bit because there is a there is a a tartness and a intensity and a sharpness in cheese they kind of drilled through some of those more beautiful, elegant, broad categories, uh, qualities that were in the middle, middle palate. And what you were left with was, you know, an effervescence, but not a ton of character in the sake. So in order of my preference, I would say one, two, three, the um, potato chip with ocetric caviar was beautiful. The caponata was gorgeous and still equally good, but just a little different. The Montazio, I think the same would be both Parmigiano Reggiano, was a little dominant. But, but still lovely. I mean, it, it actually, it depends what you want to do. If you want to feature the sake, I would go more with the others, the character and quality of the sake. And this is a beautiful sake, by the way. And if you want to enjoy something without much thought, I would go with the, the uh, Frico, the cheese. All right, now we're going to play with the next one. I'm so happy that I get to, I'm so sorry you don't have to, boy, do I wish you were all here tasting this with me. I feel very embarrassed. Are these okay. dishes that you made specifically for this event or is it like, do you also serve it at your restaurant? Is it available for us? Um, yes and no. So the, this one I'm doing now, which is the, um, I just destroyed it, but the, the pomegranate consomme with the crudo, that's currently on our menu, but that changes quite a bit. Um, but we, we had a chance to try this earlier to make sure that it was work, you know, but when we set up this tasting right. and thought that it would be really nice. It has shifted over to a carrot sort of consomme now, so it's not quite the same on the menu, but this one we tested earlier a few weeks ago or whatever when we set this up and it works really well. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go with uh, number two, 
Oh, and uh, the last dish is currently on the menu, but that's new. All right, so Zangi, I absolutely love the pomegranate that you used. It looks absolutely gorgeous. And then when it comes up on those scallops, you see pink instead of like the deep garnet color. It's, it's so pretty to look at, I love it. Thank you. So this one has, you know, obviously why I'm using scallops because scallops are very sweet. They're very mm -hmm. neutral. When they're fresh, they're almost like candy and they don't have any of the salinity or some of those characters of an oilier, heavier fish, like a mackerel, for example, very, very heavy. Right. So they, they dance well a lot with a lot of things, meaning they, they're sort of a foil, if you will, a neutral, more or less sweet neutral foil with um, the rest of the dish. So that's why it's so important to build a character around it. And um, that's what we did here. Now the popper is, and you, you can get the recipe from us, is just that slow, uh, cooking, if you will, in olive oil of garlic to the point that it becomes little crispy toasties. Mm. And it takes some of the more aggressive nature of, of garlic out, which are sometimes considered antisocial. Right. <laughs> but they also cre they create crunch, but they also create a real pop of intense flavor. And that's the magic of this dish because it's a, it's a very contrasting character and flavor with, um, with, a, with the sake, but also the scallops. Mm. Mm. Well, opposites attract. <laughs> yes, they typically attract and sometimes do very well. I mean, it's, it's you want to either have a marriage or, or sort of a contrasting uh, yeah. combination of, of flavors. And this one is a little both. But so what this dish does all together to me is it really lightens up. Not that this sake was ever heavy, but, you know, I talked about some of the um, there, there, there are notes of richness in it, but still that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that ripeness, I likened it to a be beautifully made uh, sunny ripe year of, of Sancerre. Uh, those have all gone away. And what you're left with is an absolutely clear, clean, gorgeous, like dance, just a lovely sparkling, not, not sparkling in a um, bubble sort of way, but, you know, really bright uh, experience from the sake, which, you know, so it takes, more of the acid components and it took away some of the more heavier fruit character of it, which I think is attractive because, you know, sometimes as we move into hotter weather, we want a certain lightness, you know, in our right. diet and also in our choices of beverage. So this one did it pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, now, as you remember this one, we're going to go back to the, um, the, this dish, which is the, the compote. All right. Uh, the, the duck confit, oops, are we good? All right, there we are. Yeah. <laughs> um, good, now this one, again, I'm gonna taste this sake again. Mm. In comparison, again, a powerhouse. I mean, we're, there is a layer of weight on this, which uh, layers down on the, on the palate and it's pretty strong. It's got a bold character. Relatively speaking, it's still a delicate and beautiful little mm -hmm. one, but uh, oops, what am I doing here? Um, so yeah, it's, it's still bold. So what I, let's try and see if we did a good match here and um, and get some of this duck confit going. I mean, sorry, chicken confit. Chicken. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> that could be you guys. <laughs> Okay, so as I'd hoped, you know, alcohol, mm. higher alcohol wines and sake, you know, present a little challenge. So what you need with that is something that's going to, so you would never want to do it with the previous dish, which is the scallops. Or, you know, in most cases, you want to be careful around things that have salinity, uh, any flavors of the sea, like mm -hmm. etc. Uh, caviar. And you want something that uh, mirrors, if you will, um, something of a, a darker character uh, choice in meat. And that's why these leg meat, you know, the, the chicken confit, I think work pretty well. So what's left of this is um, how it presents after it is, there's still, you know, a, a plenty of weight, but, you know, some of the more delicate, you know, flower type characters, I'm using terms that Toshi is probably cringing at, but, you know, some of those high tone flower, flower characters and possible fruit, um, mm -hmm are still left there's a there's a layer of creaminess underneath but there's a there's a hint of you know 
not spice, mild sort of baking spice that's left in the back of the palate. And that really, mm -hmm. to me, is attractive, but it's also an indication of that's, that's a, an alcohol thing, really, but not mm -hmm. in a good way. It's not peppery, not, that would be negative. This is more baking spice, so it's, it's really attractive. So that's a quick summary. I could continue to eat and drink for you all the time. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I made you drink, made you, uh, made you drink this sake today and you still have to walk tonight. Sorry yeah. about that. That's okay, all it. over. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I, I think like for the, Norm, normal person, you know, like as much as we want to try these dishes out, um, you know, at the restaurant or at home, I think a lot of people are a little intimidated. So like, do you think there's any way you can simplify this for some of us? The dishes? Yeah, like if you oh, could yeah. maybe swap some things out, or maybe, you know, for the, the crudo, like, I guess it doesn't have to be avocado mousse per se, but you could just have avocado. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. So thank you. Let me just walk through that dish. So mm -hmm. in, scallops could be replaced for some very clean uh, fish. I'm sorry. Um, it could be shrimp, you know, or something clean, you know, even a freshwater, not a freshwater, but, um, but, a, but a good clean shrimp from cold water. Just use palm juice, you know, palm with a little lemon. You just buy pomegranate juice at the store and, and maybe put a little seasoning with a little lime juice and a little bit of uh, salt and that you wouldn't have to go through and make a consomme out of it. And then just sliced avocado would be just fine. Um, the, uh, you don't need to do those little sweet potato matchsticks that we put on top. You could probably just go buy sweet potato chips and <laughs> crumble a little bit up, up and put it right on there. Um, this, the, the garlic, you know, that takes time. You just either have to do it or choose to do it or not, but it's mm. not incredibly important to the dish. Instead of making a homemade a aioli, you could either buy an aioli uh, from a nice shop or you can uh, cheat a little bit and go get some high quality mayonnaise and then just uh, <laughs> and season that with a little, uh, I would say lemon juice, salt, and um, you could throw some garlic in there if you wanted to. But um, so yeah, you, you, know, there's, you just, all you're doing is taking the concept of what yeah. we're doing there and building it back up. So if you, I always try to get people to release any kind of fear they have over mm -hmm. cooking, I try to get people to release the, the, their attachment to recipes in a strictest form and just um, lose the fear of failure and experiment. But everyone on this call and everyone that cares about food and wine, you all have a palate. You, if you trust your taste and you trust your, you know, your taste memory, you will recreate this in, in your own way, but it'll still be excellent and just as good. But you know, drop off the shackles and have some fun. Words of wisdom. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think uh, a lot of fear of failure holds people back from playing around with food or, you know, feeling like they have to stick to the recipe. And, uh, yeah. you know, it, it doesn't hurt to stick to the recipe, but if you're really uncomfortable, but it's always nice to play around as well and create something different and new. Yes. No, stick with recipes when it comes to baking and bread and desserts. <laughs> yes. it's very, very important. It's a science. But, but yes. when we're doing things like this, just get the idea of it. Mm. Like you said, avocado mousse, a little more complicated. You could use guacamole. It would taste fine. It would taste great. So, yeah. Aksan, what, what, what is your best ever pairing with sake? What was the best dish you ever had in pairing with sake? Well, like, Toshio san, I've I've had except, a lot except, of sake. except sushi, except sushi and uh, sashimi right. and others. Uh, you know that it's two things. One, I've I've had a lot of sake thanks to you, sir. <laughs> and so I, my memory is not as good as it once was. <laughs> no, um, you know we remember we did a, a, a Funum a sake and food pairing. 10 or 12 years ago and you came to it, uh, you did a, a instructional class here certifying some people uh, in sake. And yeah, 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 that yeah. night we did that little, there was some in that one that I thought were really cool. I can't remember exactly, but that was one of the early ones we had done and you were there. So I was pretty nervous and you seemed to like it, but yeah, yeah, um, I did. 
you know, there, one of the things that I've learned is there, we make the salsa verde. It's a, it's basically, I would rather, I, I call it our cilantro basil um, and our cilantro pesto. And it's, a, it's essentially a pesto, but we use pumpkin seeds and cilantro and lime juice and, you know, all, th all great flavors from, from Mexico and south of the border. And, you know, I was doing a dish with that once and I don't remember, I think it was, uh, I think we did some, um, we had these sweet shrimp, they were uh, Monterey Bay spot prawns, I think. And I used that cilantro, that salsa verde, which is typically a, a Mexican uh, dish or, or sauce. And those two, the sweet spot prawns from Monterey Bay and the, and the salsa verde, along with a sparkling uh, unfiltered sake is one of the more, my more magical, I think, uh, pairings that I thought was great. <laughs> oh, great, 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 great. Uh, Maxan, can you talk about your, the different difference between your uh, restaurant and Taban? Yes, um, so, so the restaurant Charbel's has been around for a long time and that really is a, um, it's a real community, it's a place, it's basically like a, a, a club without dues. You know, we have, we're a very local restaurant. We're very local in how we pro procure our, all of our ingredients, which is not unusual, but 27 years ago, it was, it was a little more challenging in Arizona it was, and it was new. Um, but we have just always been ingredient driven. You know, my experience is trained in France, but I also love the Mediterranean basin, which is North Africa and the whole basin. And I also am a big fan of, um, uh, Japanese food. I'm a fan of Vietnamese. Uh, I've studied a little bit Indian cuisine, uh, and but I also like American classics, like my mom's macaroni and cheese, for example. So it's it's basically the, all the foods I love, but we try to put it together in a way that you know it's, it, it keeps moving, it keeps it, it's exciting, and it it's innovative, and we really honor 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 honor. Uh, things that are just unique and special and the seasons are very short like we're starting to run into morale season that'll not be that long you know white you know I only get certain things from certain places but white asparagus you can get year-round but from the Champagne area or northern Italy you can only get it for a short period of time and you know they're pretty spectacular and the window is short um, whether it be fiddlehead ferns from Maine or uh, you know sea blythe I used to call it or sea beans are often called from an area in Maine that um we can only get a certain time of year in the late, uh, in the early summer. And so we just kind of like honor it. And when they're gone, they're gone, you know? Uh, and it's, it's not unusual. A lot of people do it, but we just have so much fun with it every, every year. Um, so that's Starbells. We've, uh, COVID, we've transitioned the tavern into a wine bar, a small plates wine bar, which is really a, an homage and tribute to Willie's wine bar that I worked at in Paris when I was a culinary student. And I always wanted to have a wine bar and I figured, COVID gave me a perfect opportunity <laughs> to do that. So I have this wonderful chef, Jose, who came from Chicago uh, just before COVID hit. And uh, we built him a little kitchen behind the bar. And he does just the most spectacular small plates and, you know, just super innovative. So it's kind of a blend between inspiration from around the world, but mostly, you know, but if you've ever been to Barcelona or Barcelona and had done the, you know, 16 best Tapas uh, bars there, you'll walk away just stunned, right? Which I've done a couple, been lucky to do a couple of times. And that, if you were to, I, I would say a lot of the inspiration is that is we're just trying to stun people with the simplicity and the beauty and the diversity of what you can get. We even took uh, bikinis, which are you know a, something you get in Barcelona, which are just little uh, grilled cheese sandwiches essentially, but you know they have lots of different uh, things we put in them. And we change them all the time. But so we're just playing. All we do is have fun. I mean, honestly, if we're not happy and we're not playing in either of these restaurants, then we're, we have to shift because it is the joy that comes from the talented chefs that work for me. Uh, I just think that that's what makes it all worth, worth uh, what we do. So that's it. Plus, we have like, a, you know, a couple million dollars worth of wine. You know, in the wine store between Tarbell's and the wine store, we've been collecting wine at Tarbell's for 26 years, and we just have a cuckoo amount of wine, and we sell a lot of wine too because people are drinking <laughs> these days. So, and sake. We're, you know, my so you, my, I have to say about sake. I've been trying to sell sake at Tarbell's by the glass. It's we're we're not a Japanese restaurant for almost 23 years, and finally, and at the store here, finally at the store we're selling, and finally, you know, it takes a little you. while. Thank yeah. you for thank you for being 
occupation. <laughs> yeah, well, I believe that it has to be out there in the uh, world of food, wine, and all Thank kinds you. of good beverages. So speaking of sake, though, um, we actually have a question. So yes. if it's a dish that's a bit on the heavier side, like dark meat or fatty meat, how do you go about deciding whether you should pair that sake with a dry sake or a sake that's heavier like a nama genshu? Well, I think that it has to do with the kind of meat. So when you choose dry, you're trying to cut something. You know, if there's fattiness or inherent richness in the meat, like a Wagyu A plus, Wagyu 5 plus, you, you don't, you, it is so fatty, it needs, I think, something linear to, to cut through it. Not always, there's always examples, right? Mm -hmm. but, if it's, but if it's something, the sweeter stuff, just always know, in my opinion, the sweet is gonna cover something. So if the meat, um, if the meat is good, but you know, let's just say it's a New York strip from somewhere, some ranch in this country, but not particularly special, I might choose something a little sweeter just because I want something to really layer over it and almost take on a sauce-like character. That would be my choice. Now, I urge everyone to play, but that would be uh, how I would approach it, essentially. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, for a drier sake, it's like if you want to cut through something. And I think if it's something like a little bit heavier or sweeter, like a nama genshu, like more full flavor, I, I think it would be a meat that has a kind of sweetness to it or sweet sauce yeah. with it. Um, but like Mark said, you're going to want to play around. Personally, the way I like to pair sake is, is like when you drink it, it makes you hungry for something. And that's the best way to figure out what works. <laughs> Well, it comes to mind, duck would probably be really good with sweet sake, you know, yeah. honestly, and that would be just uh, instinctually where I would go to start playing mm -hmm. around and trying it. Beautiful. I mean, you did chicken this time, but. <laughs> well, I did. <laughs> Play around. Yeah. yeah, I did. And it worked out pretty well. Awesome. Perfect. Um, so I think hopefully we'll be able to get the photos since not everybody was able to see it and we'll have them up on our website by tomorrow. Um, but were there any, I wonder if there's any other questions out there, guys, you don't get to ask a, a chef of this caliber, many questions on the daily basis. Uh, Max, -san. Yes. Wagyu beef. Thank you for, yes. thank you for having Wagyu beef too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I know you're serving them. And uh, how, do you, how do you usually serve your Wagyu beef to, at your restaurant? How do we serve it normally? Is that what the question? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> well, it's either a quick sear, um, you know, blood rare, or we do it crudo, we do it raw. You know, it just depends on where we're going. Now we may have certain accompaniments with it. You know, we may caramelize, if it's raw, we may have caramelized shallots or subis, or we might, we may have, um, we sometimes, we don't want to dominate or totally control to, to a large extent the, the beauty of the meat. We're almost do things to highlight it. So we don't do a very, don't do a lot with it. You know, it's sometimes we'll sprinkle it with this crispy garlic that we make, which, you know, that is a bit of a distraction, but it's so rich, you know, that it does work. Um, sometimes we'll do it in more of a traditional um, sense where we might, uh, microplane some um, uh, some Parmigiano Reggiano, 24 month old, you know, um, Oro Blanco, uh, Bianco, excuse me, uh, Parmigiano Reggiano, um, and salt and black and cracked black pepper. Uh, you know, it, it just we do it in a lot of ways, but largely we're just trying not to get in the way of the beauty of the Hawaii. What's the situation like now for the uh, Arizona restaurant? Uh, COVID situation wise? You know, it's like all of the country, it's been very hit very hard, but um, <clears throat> we were able to get back open. I didn't, but we were able to get back open 50% back in May and that continued up right on through. And then the governor uh, allowed us to, without zoning or restriction, without any red tape, we could just move out into the parking lot or out into the streets or whatever. So that was very beneficial because our weather is very nice here right now. And it started in December. So these were things that were good and were helpful to us as a restaurant industry, but it has been hit very hard. And what mm -hmm. I'm seeing is that people are coming back. I do a show for P public PBS 
and I'm, I was out earlier today just su supporting, a, uh, doing a filming at a local taco place. And, you know, he is so happy to be back in business. And he was busy today. He was very busy. I mean, he has an outdoor patio, so it's nice. And but indoor a little bit, too. It's still spaced out. We're not able to seat 100% capacity yet. But, you know, I think people are making, uh, making their way. So I do believe our future will be good. The only challenge is we got summer coming. And most people, if they can leave, they leave Arizona because it's very hot. So I think by next December, January, we'll all be good. So your restaurant is 50% or outside only? It's 50% inside and then we have patio. Yes. So okay. inside we're 50% and then we have a patio. So <laughs> since we did not have a patio before, with we're 100, we're basically the same number of tables, which is a very beautiful thing because we can operate safely inside at a good distance and no problem. And then we have the patio, which is also spaced out, but we have so many those tables are you know new to us that we didn't have a patio before. It's good. Yeah, we're lucky. So. And do you do delivery and uh, takeouts right now? Yes, we did it a little differently right the moment we were closed, which was um, a year and two days ago. We had never done delivery or takeout here at all. In fact, we refused to do it because we protected the quality of our food, right? We were concerned about it. But obviously, that was the only thing available to us. So instead of instead of using uh, third party deliveries like Uber Eats or Grubhub, we actually kept all our servers and we bought cars and we had about eight or nine cars running at one point. We rented cars wow. um, and we used all our servers in uniforms. You know, they're, they're all people that our customers know because they've been in the restaurant. And I think it was a very good way to do it. Uh, very complicated and a little bit expensive, but, and then we were able to ensure that our quality was getting there. And also that even though it was touchless, we could drop it and wave and just have some sort of warmth, you know, in that mm -hmm. very dark time that we all went through where everyone was afraid of everything. And um, we, we could add a little element of kindness, you know, and, and familiarity. And so it was, a, it ended up being very successful and uh, we continue to do it even today. So um, even though we're open now, but we still, we're going to keep on, keep on doing that too. Great. Right. That's awesome. I love that you're able to keep your servers and, you know, give them something to do during that time. Yeah, yeah. And it was uh, it was crazy, <laughs> crazy <laughs> times, but we all got better for it. And our team is amazing. And we all our culture got stronger. And, um, you know, we just saw a lot of beautiful things happen, you know, with our team yeah. during that time. Awesome. Um, yeah. I'm not sure how to transition out of that. but. <laughs> um, so oh. I just wanted to go back quickly to the versatility of sake. Um, you know, would you say like with wine, when you have the wrong wine pairing, it really just stands out and it just brings out the worst qualities in both the food and the wine. But with sake, it's a little mm -hmm. bit more forgiving. It is more forgiving. And I think that a lot of it has to do with it's, it's the nature of it. I think, you know, mm -hmm. wine has, well, most wine these days is made with a lot more alcohol than your average sake, right? So to me, alcohol is like, too much alcohol is like too much sugar. I mean, sugar is nice and alcohol is nice, but too much is, mm. can, it, it, what it does is it creates a very complicated and challenging uh, relationship with the food and wine pairing. So as long as, you know, sakes are made, you know, in, uh, with restraint, you know, mm -hmm. uh, unless there's some sakes that are intentionally made with high alcohol, and then you use them differently. But if not, as long as they're made with restraint when it comes to that and they're, they're still concerned about protecting the essence of the character or whatever kind of essence they're gonna do, it's, it's generally gonna play well with others, I like to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's also certain acids in um, sake that tend to complement seafood much better as well, correct, Duenosan? Yeah, uh, you know, like uh, cystic acid and lactic acid, especially cystic acid, you can find in the uh, shellfish, oyster, lobster, uh, shrimp, and any kind of shellfish has a lot of cystic acid. And also, as we mentioned, Mark uh, tried today too, the cheese has a lot of lactic acid, and sake has a lot of lactic acid too. And, you know, sake also has umami uh, that, that are uh, amino acid that are as a drinks doesn't have it, the sake has. So that's uh, something uh, many people should think about 
even though they are not, uh, you know, uh, Japanese restaurant like Mark, you know, he's, uh, you know, incorporating the sake in his uh, restaurant. Uh, many people should try too. And I just want to know, yes. like, how has it been um, introducing sake to people? I know it's been difficult for you guys, but like, what has helped you overcome that? Um, when we have the most success is when we're able to do dinners and feature mm -hmm. uh, sake and uh, food pairings. Um, I'll remember back, it was probably 17 years ago, the very first one I did, because we do a fair amount of wine and wineries. You know, we feature wineries and do wine and food pairing, and we have for years. But um, when I did my first one 17 years ago, um, it was kind of a little bit difficult because I literally had to invite everyone as my guest. One person signed up to pay. But the rest of the people, I just called all my friends and people and I just said, come, please be my guest because I wanted them to experiment. And it's interesting. Some of these people are regulars at our, at our winery dinners. Mm -hmm. And they, even though it's 17 year later, years later, they still remember that as something very surprising and wonderful. So <clears throat> what we need to do more of here and what we will do more of, and we, we talk about it is just regularly do these uh, sake and food pairings with Western food mm -hmm. so that people can be introduced to it in a very safe way. They mm -hmm. choose to come here. It's social. It's fun. We curate everything. So it's yeah. done for them. We do the pairings and the food and they just can sit back and enjoy the experience. And if the more we do that, the more we will open people up to, to trying it on their own because everything mm -hmm. is about a lack of understanding and Absolutely. fear, you know, no one understands it or no one's aware of it so they just don't even think of it or they're mm -hmm. they would like to do it but they're scared because they don't even know which sake to pick you know so right. if we can be a pathway for that and help then i think that's good all right i, I, I will send the ida san to your restaurant oh please please <laughs> undercover please, please, to write please. a review no <laughs> oh well um, you know what I, if we can all I uh, agree that when things get comfortable for you to travel, we'd love to host another um, dinner here with you and mutual trading and to yeah. be able to show off what we're talking about. Yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. we'd like we to do that. Also certify more people in Arizona. That's always good. All awesome. right. Great. We would love that. And just a final question here before we move on to um, closing remarks and announcements. So Donna Ma asked, what is the best approach to ask wine bars and fresh dress French restaurants to add sake to their menu? Um, well, I think if uh, the best approach would be to take the wine approach and communicate sake in wine terms, number one. Number two, I would challenge them to, everyone's looking for a hook or something different or something uh, exciting, right? And to be yeah. brave and to be courageous and to do it just one by the glass. and and train the staff, offer to train the staff would be nice, but train mm -hmm. the staff to understand that one. Don't try to do 50 sakis by the glass. Don't try to do 10, just one. And then get one dish that it works particularly well with and train everybody to love, fall in love with it. And that's the beginning. And then maybe two, you know, you have two dishes, two sakis. But <clears throat> if you're looking at trying to create entertainment and experience, this is what I've always tried to do, is you wanna surprise people. You wanna even sometimes shock them. You want to make them a little bit nervous, but not uncomfortable, if, that's, if that makes sense. And this is what you have to challenge people to do. And I, you know, I, hey, I haven't been 100% successful with it, but this is what I'm, I, I have a lot of years to, left to go, <laughs> although I do get a little more of the silver here, but I am committed to uh, seeing this through and being able to have this part of our, part of our voice here. That's absolutely great advice. And, you know, to add on that, I would say be tenacious. Like if you're a customer, um, not, not, you know, business to business, but as a customer, just keep asking and hopefully they'll take notice and they'll start adding yeah. it onto there. And I think from like a business perspective, I think choosing a sake to recommend that has a fantastic story behind it is the way to go. It's going to be memorable and, you know, everybody on your staff will be able to, you know, pitch it to the customer. One more thing on that, if I may, what yes. we were going to do before COVID interrupted us is we were going to put sake on our regular wine list, but in the category of like Chardonnay or in the category oh. of Laura Valley that had a similar character so right. that we would, we'd have it, we'd have it separate too, 
but we du duplicate it in areas where they had a profile that was similar mm -hmm. to other more f familiar um, categories. And that way, if you're reading down the sparkling wine, for example, and you go, wait a second, this is <laughs> sparkling sake, and it would beg a question, right? So we right. were trying to trip people into asking a question and then taking a chance. Now we didn't do it. We, I told you, Toshio san, that I was going to do that before COVID, and we just never everything got messed up. But you know, I'm sitting here across from my uh, director, fine director of wine and service, and he's listening to every word. And I know he's writing the wine list right now <laughs> with sake in it. Very bold. I like that tactic. Right. Um, yeah. Well, it's just it's going to stop them and go what? Okay, tell me why is this here? <laughs> I'd have been you like, know. you guys made a mistake. <laughs> no, but. yes. No, no, no. Totally. <laughs> Accidentally on purpose. Mm. And, you know, another thing is like, we've been talking about how education is a big part in having people carry sake or even try sake. So if you go to a wine bar or a French restaurant, you know, maybe you can say, yeah, I love sake with French food. You guys need to start carrying it and just yes. you know, explain it a little. So, yeah. Yes. Well, the other thing is, if you if you can, restaurant business is very tough business. But mm -hmm. if you can um, offer, you know, investment in it, if you can take it and say, please try this, mm -hmm. you know, please, you know, have a little taste, you know, enjoy. That's on me. I want you to experience, uh, preferably with something that you know, food wise, a little a little amuse, a little something that goes well with it. That would be another way to go because you know you're basically taking all the uh, all the risk out. You're just giving mm -hmm. them a taste and. They can like it or not like it, or they can love it and want to learn more or whatever, but you know, it's good. Yes, thank you. All right, let's move on to a uh, final announcement. Uno san. Okay. So here's a uh, uh, Mark Tabell's uh, restaurant's uh, address, website information, uh, business hours. And uh, there is another one, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, airport ones, uh, Terminal 3 and, and Phoenix. And you should be able to enjoy his uh, both wine and his dish. Okay. And then the last announcement is next webinar we have is next uh, same day, uh, Thursday, and which is, I'm not about to see myself, sake winner with uh, Japanese cuisine at uh, um, uh, Goodwill Ambassador, and I'll be doing a sake uh, seminar. So please uh, join me on this, and thank you, and uh, Final words from uh, our honorable guest, Mark Sandoza. <laughs> well, I'm just so grateful for Ida and um, Toshio san. Thank you very much for asking me to do this. Um, it's one of the pleasures to, to be your friend and also to be able to be a part of this conversation. And I just really am grateful and thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much Domo for being arigato. here. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I cannot thank you enough. Uh, you know, uh, only things I can, uh, you know, uh, this this Kate is that that we go to your place uh, in the future and do the sake tasting, and uh, we, I'm looking forward to it. And yeah, and thank you for everyone who came to this session. Appreciate it. And this is going to be recorded, and you will be able to see it. Uh, you tell your uh, friends if someone missed it. This is a great session. Uh, you can see at the YouTube. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Looking forward Thank to you see much. you. See you soon. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Good night. <laughs>